what in the world is going on at Ohio State? I leave for four days, and then there's 500 pieces of news. I guess I just can't take vacation, or maybe I should, because clearly Bill Landis and Jeremy Birmingham can handle all of this without me, and I am no longer needed here. What, what did I miss here? How did this all happen at once? I, I think we should really uh, experiment with this and just like have you go to Disney World again, like at the end of this week, and then see if Ohio State just adds five more players and just for kicks another offensive coordinator. Oh, yeah. I mean, is there anybody left for them to add? I don't know what's <laughs> like, I don't even know how they've made all of this work, but I, I'm, I was certainly, you know, getting updates on my phone like, oh, well, there's a five star safety on the way. We thought that might happen. Oh, there's an offensive coordinator. There's a five star quarterback. Didn't know that that was something that was in the works, but here we are. And we're on the podcast daily. I am back to get up to speed. Berm, the most recent one was Sunday with Julian saying, what, what prompted this? I know you guys broke this down on some snap judgments, but this did not seem like it was part of the quarterback plan when I left. It wasn't part of the quarterback plan until Julian Sain decided to go into the transfer portal. And then even after that, it was about another 16 hours or so until Ohio State decided that it was worth the effort. Um, it was not the plan on Friday afternoon. Uh, you know, Sain, this is the funny thing is because we're now in this world of, of legal tampering or whatever you want to call it. Like when, <laughs> when the kid goes into the transfer portal on Friday morning, there's as soon as he announces, there's already stories out there. Um, Tom Loy at 247 Sports had one about how Ohio State was the projected uh, favorite to land him. And, and that stuff comes from the the side of, of people out in California who are, who are close to the situation. It's not like Ohio State is reaching out to say, and at that point, it's saying people are reaching out and saying, hey, this is where he'd like to go. Um, then at like one o'clock on Friday, I was told pretty explicitly, we don't think we're going to do it. Uh, and then at like seven o'clock, it was like, I think we're going to do it. And then Saturday afternoon it was like, okay, we're definitely doing it. And so like the, the conversation changed, um, pretty dramatically over the course of 16 hours. And, um, as Bill and I talked about on Sunday, the, the biggest reason you do it and why it happens is because when the best quarterback in your mind in the class of 2024 wants to choose your team, you say yes. And, uh, it, it's not something where you, I mean, you can, you can get paralysis by analysis pretty quick if you allow yourself to but at the end of the day you just have to be willing to say yes to the best players in the country and ohio state believes that julian saying was that quarterback um when they recruited him and they believe that he's that quarterback as of now they don't think that the two weeks he spent in tuscaloosa ruined him you know what i mean <laughs> yeah well you know that decision and making it quickly when you have to being able to be in position to make a move on caleb downs taking your time and then uh, that's a little bit different approach, but Bill O'Brien is still uh, highly thought of in both the NFL and college football circles for his offensive acumen. So stacking these all one on top of the other and Dominic Kirk's, uh, I guess, as well, it feels like to me this offseason, even if it didn't start with the level of urgency that maybe I would have expected in, uh, in, uh, in December, like this has been a pretty ruthless Ryan Day stretch. And I wonder why it didn't quite happen to this level in the previous couple off seasons when you already had losses to Michigan. Uh, you were falling short of the Big Ten championship. You were not getting you know, to the national championship game or winning it. But whatever, whatever prompted it, and clearly there's a change, whether that was Michigan actually winning that final game and another trophy or not, I don't know whether that's enhanced NIL support, whether this is just Ryan Day recognizing the stakes for him this offseason. I mean, these are all pretty big swings. And even Caleb Downs, which seemed like a pretty obvious one, given the, their how close they were in the initial recruitment, it's still a, a case where in, in previous years we might have been talking about like Eli Ricks and Ohio State saying, mm, I don't know. Uh, I'm not saying that their situations are identical, but just like eh, disrupt the room pretty good. Keep for the future. Like both at quarterback and now at safety, they've taken two swings in a couple of days that, I don't feel like they probably would have taken them as aggressively in years past. And I think all of them are showing that, like, I think that urgency did exist. Berm, you, you made that case dating back to the end of the season. Uh, and just because it didn't happen on a timeline that 
I would have preferred or, or Bill and our Bill or Zach Bourne and I talked about like you were right. He had a lot of uh, confidence that big things were coming. Yeah, the, the that's today's episode. Burn was right. I'm, I'm here for that. Let's celebrate. No, the, the Downs thing is just a situation where even on Friday, I mean, uh, we, again, we talked about this at length on Saturday morning on Caleb Downs, but Ohio State at four o'clock on Friday afternoon was like, we we don't think this is going to happen. It's an uphill battle. He, you know, I've, I've talked to people at Georgia who fairly confidently say they had begun the admissions process at Georgia, and then the family just decided we're stopping this and, and went with Ohio State. So, like, I think just being willing to take that swing is, as you said, like that in itself puts you in a position to win these fights. And and maybe it's because Caleb Downs was such a great fit for Ohio State program wise that that you know, as opposed to the Eli Ricks thing where. There were some r red flags off the field a little bit that, that kept you from going all in. There's none of that with Caleb Downs, but I think it's a combination of all three of those things you mentioned. I think it's a situation where Ohio State sees Michigan go out and, and go, um, you know, push all the chips to the center and win a national title. Uh, and then you have the what appears to be finally like a co coalescing of the NIL collectives and trying to work together as opposed to constantly battling each other for some reason for for ego's sake and then you throw that in with everything that ryan day has on the table and on the, at stake for him this offseason and i think it's just the perfect storm of of saying there's no there's no time for for overthinking this stuff you guys did a lot of shows over the previous couple of days so i didn't want to just rehash all the news itself i i thought the thing that interests me the most was was lumping them all together because i didn't get to you know outside of Bill O'Brien and, and popping on late in that snap judgments uh, live on whatever day that was Thursday or Friday. I don't know. They all ran together for me as I am sure they did for you guys. Like I'm looking at them collectively. And then from the most distance that I've ever had in covering an off season like this and thinking it, it it's different for Ryan day, all of them handling the coaching staff, handling the transfer portal, handling the recruitment, which or elite recruitment, however you want to view this with, with saying and disrupting the future plans at quarterback, which they've always Ohio State has always been very protective of and and tried to maintain that continuity. So, I mean, it, if it is rediscovering some of that personality and then to use some of the, the terminology that we spent the previous 12 months, like hoping was going to come back with Georgia Ryan Day, like I, there's no guarantee that any of these or all of them are going to work, but if you don't try, like uh, it wasn't working before the previous three years, you weren't getting the results you wanted. You had to do something different. Yeah. I, I think that there's just a, a greater understanding now of, you know, the, the, the way the world works, I, I think. And, and Ohio, and that's on like the NIL front sort of figuring out how you need to be organized and like actually attack that. And I think Ohio state was, was playing catch up for a little bit and, and, trying to get a lay of the land and and like what is realistic and, and what would actually make them competitive. Um, and I think they've done that, but also too, like, I just, I just don't think in college football anymore, you can like sit on your hands if you have the opportunity to add really good players um, for whatever the reasons might be. Now, none of us were expecting Nick Saban to retire and it's created some, some additional opportunities for Ohio state to flex this muscle. Um, you know, if, if, that had not happened. We'd be sitting here talking about adding like Will Howard, Seth McLaughlin, Will Keck Merrick, and Bill O'Brien, which would still be a really good offseason. But, but there, there was a, and we couldn't say Jenkins. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe the, I forgot the best uh, running back in the country. My, my apologies. <laughs> um, which would have still been a tremendous offseason, but the, the Alabama uh, bombshell there with Saban has, has, you know, amplified it. I don't even know how many times it's, it's ridiculous now what Ohio State's been able to do in in light of that. But but I I do think it is, you know, accepting some hard truths. I think about about the way that Ohio State was trying to go about business prior to this offseason. And I'm not even saying that that was like necessarily inherently wrong, or, or or at least the motivation wasn't. Like I understand being concerned about your locker room and and wanting to make sure that your culture is strong and um maybe in some cases wanting to make sure you like you have lines of communication with guys so they understand like hey why why is this happening i but i think there's a way to balance that i think there's a way to balance all of that all those things that are important to ohio state that i believe still are with ratcheting up the aggression when it comes to adding to your roster and now they're trying to do it i i think time will tell a little bit on whether or not they're doing it the right way not, not that i'm concerned about it but 
Um, I think there is a way to kind of be both. And, and there's only a handful of programs in college football that I think can be both. And Ohio State is certainly one of them. Um, and I think it's about time that they embrace being it. So, so I think it's a good step for them uh, moving forward. Uh, it's a little, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say frustrating. Frustrating is probably the wrong word. It was always a little odd to me that, that it took them so long to realize that they could do this. But I'm, I'm glad at least that they finally have come around to it. Let me ask you this question. Do you think that any part of, of that decision the, or the timing of this decision to, to realize what you can do is just Ryan Day himself understanding the leverage he has in this situation as Gene Smith is on his way out, as mm -hmm. Ted Carter comes in, knowing that, hey, if, what are they going to do, fire him? He's, he, you owe him $60 million if you fire him. So like maybe it's an opportunity for Ryan Day to s sort of be the big swinging in the room for once and say, hey, the this second big, time he's made that reference in 24 big, hours. By the, way. The, big, the big swinging <laughs> clock? What, pendulum? I mean, what? I, I'm just saying, like, do you think that that has anything to do with it? Like, this is a, Ted Carter yes. and, and Ross Bjork are going to come into a situation, and Ryan Day is the person who is going to be firmly and squarely in the spotlight for each of those two making some uh, decisions for the future. And I think this is a, a, a guy understanding, like, I'm going to go out there and I have to swing as hard as I can right now. Otherwise I, I put myself in a position to be, you know, cut off at the knees. Yeah. I, I think, I think if you're Ryan day, you almost want to like reset expectations a little bit. Like, and it's not, listen, Gene Smith did a lot of really good things for a high state athletic department. I just, I just think he was a, you know, part of an older guard that probably was never going to be totally comfortable with, with what was necessary to be competitive at the highest level in the new version of college football. Um, and Ohio state needed to be, I think Ryan Day understands that, and I think he has a president and an athletic director, or at least he will have an athletic director who also understands that, and he is the one, Ryan Day, who I think is like now trying to lay that foundation in the interim, and like Ted Carter is here, and I think is very much you know, plugged into what's going on with, with college football, um, and when Ross Bjork starts officially in July, I think he'll hit the ground running with, with similar ideas. And yes, I, I do. I do think you're on to something there, Berm. I think that the change in power structure, I think, has allowed a little bit of, of an opening for Ryan Day, perhaps, to push the envelope a little bit. I, I think it's a necessity for him. I, I don't think it's impressing the new bosses or making a splash or asserting your dominance over your pro, over his program because these people are not going to have any allegiance. Neither one of them were involved in Ryan Day's hiring. Uh, and I, I don't think it's isn't it closer to like 43 million currently for Ryan Day? I don't think it's 60 million. So whatever it is, it's I less than what we're in the middle of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, whatever it is, it's less than what Ross Bjork paid for the last guy he got <laughs> rid of. So I don't think it's going to be cost prohibitive if, if he wants to make that move. And and it doesn't matter anyway, because this is a new audience with those two people who will now be determining his future and the existing audience, whether that's the three of us evaluating Ryan Day's career or the more important ones that are voting with their wallets and attendance and fandom, the Ohio State fan base knows that the pressure, they're put applying the pressure. And the results are one thing. You know, the hot seat conversation is another thing. If he went, you know, four in a row, there's no coming back from that. And no new AD and no president are going to be able to save Ryan Day from that, to be completely honest. So I, I think that there are other factors. It's not just one thing, but they're Ryan Day's pushed to the brink right here. He has no choice, and he can't just say, "Well, I got to stick with the guys that I know and the loyalty on the coaching staff." And I recruited all these people originally, so I'm going to roll forward with you know Lincoln Keenholz, Devin Brown, Aaron Nolan, and the plan before. Like even like a lot of these things were happening pre Nick Saban's retirement. So it's not just that and taking advantage of an opportunity. But they did do that when the next one came and the door was open for them. And this is the first time that I would say we hear every offseason from Ryan Day, we're going to evaluate everything in the program. And then when we make some moves, we'll let you know. And a lot of times it was like one or two small things, maybe um, could be a nice pickup, you know, uh, a player, Jim Knowles. Like there were a couple moves, but there weren't. 10, 12, 13 moves or more. And this is the first time I think that you can look at it and say he evaluated the situation he's in, 
the roster that he's got, the coaches that he's surrounded himself with, the schedule that they're going to face, the college football landscape, and actually took that evaluation and acted on it. Now, that's probably unfair for me to say that, but it's the first time that I feel like I can see it being a complete and thorough evaluation of everything and not just picking and choosing one or two things and hoping that the rest of it will be outweighed by continuity because that was not working. Like That wasn't going to solve it. No, and there's still more work to be done. There's still some more um, uncomfortable conversations that he's going to have to have as, as you head into the end of this month, not being sure what the next thing for Corey Dennis is going to be if he's going to remain on staff in some way. I, I don't think he's going to be maintaining one of the 10 uh, assistant coach spots. So it, that's still the conversation with James Laurinaitis. You know, has, has James done enough in this month to get that opportunity at the full-time linebacker spot? Is there still a defensive line coach out there somewhere that they're looking at? Is there a different way they go with that? I think that it, there are still some ways for Ryan Day to to put it out there and to show people exactly what he's willing to do. But I, I think sometimes just being uncomfortable and, and realizing that you have this pressure on you forces you to be, uh, you know, to change in a way that maybe you needed to. And I, I, I I'm a big fan of Ryan Day personally. I, I think uh, that's not a secret. I, but uh, being too comfortable at times makes people um, complacent. And I, I'm not saying that he's been complacent by any stretch because, as you mentioned, when the defense needed to be fixed, he went out and hired the best defensive coordinator in the country that was available. Two years later, the Buckeyes went from being one of the worst defenses in school history to number two defense in the country. So like, he's willing to make those changes. But what, what you're suggesting on the wholesale level certainly feels different this this offseason than any of the other ones. Well, do you guys have a theory as like as to like why like I, I obviously like everything has like built up over the last three years of not a, uh, not accomplishing your goals, but like I wonder why it took three and not one or two. Like, uh, do you have any theories on why that might be the case? I wish I I wish I did, Bill. I mean, that's one of the things that I was thinking about. Like, gosh, when you stack up these moves, and I said that you know to some people in, in text when I was traveling on Sunday, it was like. Well, what if he had done some of these last year and you didn't have to do it all at once? Now, again, that's an unfair thing to say because, you know, Will Howard wasn't in the portal. They, they, they didn't have an option or that one that they really wanted to pursue with their quarterback room. But the coaching staff thing, some of those things already existed with Parker Fleming. And we were all, I, I think I can speak for all three of us when we say we were surprised that he got a new contract off, last offseason. So some of those things festered. And I, I don't know why. I mean, I guess if I was going to dive into the theory, it's that Ohio State was still winning an awful lot of games. They suspected there may have been something unusual about yeah. the way they lost in late November. They, Ryan Day is a person who values loyalty and family and continuity and chemistry. And he seemed, he didn't seem like he wanted to risk where Ohio State already was with one of the highest floors in the country to pursue a ceiling that would take them to the next level. But you can't just say over and over that there's only three goals for the program and then never actually reach your ceiling. That's how you get yeah. fired. And I, I think that more than anything, that's what's driving this. And I don't, I don't know why it didn't feel that way, but I can understand the mindset that he was probably in just from the way that we know him that, you know, and, and I'm not saying this is going to sound wrong, like blowing it up by risking, you know, these big swings and more aggressive moves. Like I can understand the impulse not to do that, but at some point you're going to run out of opportunities if you don't do something to change it. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't think, uh, you know, this has been an off season with a lot of change. But I don't know that I feel like Ryan Day's blown it up either. Like, he, I think he's he's addressed, I think, pretty obvious needs in the transfer portal. He made a a long anticipated decision at offensive coordinator, but and, and then we'll see if there's more fallout from that. But it's not like he's, you know, burning the woody to the ground and starting over from scratch, right? There, there's infrastructure there that, that they're still building on, including the the you know the was it eleven or so players that. They got to come back who could have gone off to the nfl so that, that's at least you know some some indication that he, he thought that things were working okay in some respects um and i guess like you know after one year do you blow the thing up probably not you don't panic i guess after one year 
And then the second year was weird because they lost to Michigan, but then like they almost beat Georgia. And it's like, oh right. man, maybe 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 we're that maybe that Michigan game was just a fluke and we're like right where we need to be. And then maybe <clears throat> I, it wasn't fool's gold, I don't want to say, but it's you know, it was a really well played game, and then like he lost the special quarterback who who made it. So um, and then you kind of went back to where you were were before. So I, I understand why you maybe wouldn't want to um be as aggressive in the offseason after you almost beat the beat the national champs in 2022 in the playoff game too so i guess in that way it does it does sort of make sense and it's all kind of come to a head now and i guess it's it's also probably not worth you know rehashing and fretting over why it hasn't happened sooner it's i think it's more important that it is actually happening now i have a two-pronged theory on it however first one is that as austin sort of alluded to this was the first year you didn't have any built-in excuses as to why you lost to michigan like you had in the in the last two years, there was the underbelly of 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 doubt and concern and, and questioning what had happened with Connor Stallions. Twenty twenty one, you had the flu, all the weather, all that stuff. Um, I think you could have you could talk yourself out of those losses and saying that they weren't as legitimate as this year's was. Um, but I think that the the second part of this, that coupled with the no excuses, is that he picked the wrong quarterback in twenty twenty three. And whether or not he picked the wrong quarterback four years ago when he was recruiting Kyle McCord versus JJ McCarthy, or whether or not he picked the wrong quarterback in August, I don't think it really matters either way. I think this is the first time in Ryan Day's tenure as a head coach that he has had to question himself as to whether or not he made the right decision. And I, I, I think that that can be a really eye-opening moment for a young person and a young coach to say, whoa, 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 maybe I'm not completely infallible with these de decisions I've made because everything else he'd done at quarterback to this season, uh, to, to the point this season, had been an absolute slam dunk. And so if you enter this season thinking to yourself, well, every choice I made at quarterback's been perfect. Kyle's going to be right. It's not going to hurt us. And like, you know, you, you talk about the Georgia game and yeah, you were this close. And then you head into this season thinking we don't need to make any bigger changes because the next quarterback is going to come in and be great. And then we're going to be back off and running. And then the quarterback is average to good and not great, not elite. Then it changes, I think, the way that you view yourself a little bit. And um, maybe that allows you to be willing to make bigger changes than you would have in the past, because at least now you have a moment of, of, of some sort of uh, reticence about, hey, did I do the right thing? Well, I think you can even boil that down, Berm, like specific to Bill O'Brien and offensive coordinator and play calling because all all this big picture stuff when I'm talking about the evaluation and making the moves, Ryan Day did evaluate that last year and was like prepared to move on from calling plays and putting an offensive coordinator in charge and then – you know, Brian Hartland was going to do that, and you got to, well, there's going to be some days in spring. We'll evaluate that, and then it became pretty clear that that like wasn't going to happen. Um, and I think that we we all said, well, if you get the guy who called the plays in the Peach Bowl, that's fine. Like that's one of the best ones in America. You can understand him not wanting to give that up, but but he had already recognized that his time demands as a coach were going to have to go elsewhere. He was going to have to be a fundraiser. He was going to have to be evaluating portal options. He was going to have to be roster management, like all these other things were going to be on his plate and he couldn't just coach quarterbacks and call ball plays. And then he just kind of backed away from doing that. And it, it, this is the time like, okay, he'd already, he already knew that a lot of that evaluation had gone on just like he probably had with some of the other, you know, personnel moves that have been made this off season, but now you're actually acting on it. And I think that's like that, that one move encapsulates a lot of things. And I, as I said late last week, I don't know that like that means that Bill O'Brien is going to be the best offensive play caller in college football next year or Ohio State history or what. I don't I don't know. I have no expectation for how that's going to work, but th that's the next step is if you do evaluate and you have to make a move, then you follow through and make it. And he hasn't done that in the previous couple off seasons. What it does though is it shows the the fault of making something that's a half measure. Uh, and the decision to to promote last season was done as a half measure because a you were trying to make sure you didn't have any strange or unexpected or big time staff attrition, and b you make the change but you don't bring in somebody that's commensurate with what Kevin Wilson 
left or the the hole that he left. And so, you know, we talked about it when we did the snap judgments on Bill O'Brien's hiring is that the, you go into spring this year, of Ryan Day, and you think, okay, I'm going to let this happen. And then you look around and it's 37 year old Ryan Hartline and 30 year old Keenan Bailey and 30 year old Corey Dennis. And you're like, oh, shoot, maybe this is not the setup that I need to make this happen. And so I think like last January, he had that idea like, oh, I'm going to do this. And then all of a sudden you get to the season or, or the spring practice and you go, well, I don't think I can do this. He has pushed all the chips into the table now and said, this is happening no matter what. And in some ways, that's probably pretty liberating for Ryan Day to, to take that off of your plate. Uh, but on the other side of it, it's probably also terrifying as hell because like you're Here's this coach you're giving your legacy to, and that that's got to be scary. But again, when you're making these ten million dollar a year decisions, like it's going to be, it, it it might go bad, but it might go great. So, but you you got to try it differently. Yeah, you got you got to take the swing. I think I think is the ultimate um, lesson there. And I like I like half, I like I like no more half measures. We're, we're we're past half measures. Ohio State shouldn't be dealing in half measures. It's Ohio State. So, you know, sneaking in those Breaking Bad references. I love it. That's right. It's good to be back. I feel like I was gone for seven weeks with as much news as went on. I appreciate uh, you guys both filling in while I was at Disney World. I promise I'll never do it again. Um, yes, you will. Way too much. much. <laughs> okay, stop it. Whatever. Um, we all have to take vacations sometimes. And maybe we'll test Bill next. Burn when's yours? Uh, safe February, time february 11th through the 16th oh yeah mm. perfect that'll be the quietest time i'm, of the going, year. I'm not that's gonna be a i'm gonna actually disconnect so good luck that's what can't wait kirby, kirby smart's gonna decide to become an astronaut and then all of his players are gonna become available <laughs> and ohio state's gonna add seven of them sounds great i'm ready to to pick up the slack and get back to work uh again thanks to these guys for all the coverage while i was gone hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did as I was getting caught back up to speed and back to work here. Who knows what's going to happen this week? We'll find out every day on the podcast daily. Uh, for Bill Anderson, Jeremy Birmingham, I'm Austin Ward. We'll talk to you later.